So, you know, um, light is often uh, used as a metaphor in spirituality. Uh, in the Eastern traditions, we see the light shows up as enlightenment within the individual. In Western traditions, it's more illumination that's taking place. So in Genesis, right at the very beginning of the Bible, it says that God created light and saw that it was good. <sighs> I, um, I suspect that all of us have had people in our lives who we really feel, for one reason or another, we felt like they were filled with the light. You know, that they just exuded something, there was a presence, a spirit, an activity within them that was just such a big part of who they were, who they are in our life. Uh, when I was in the cemetery, I mean seminary, uh, uh, I, had a, I had a metaphysical Bible teacher, Dr. Paul Barrett, and he'd come to us through, uh, through Unity, uh, the people who bring us the wonderful daily word. And Paul Barrett had this... Uh, incredible luminous quality about him. It was just his consciousness. It wasn't anything in particular that he said, but it was everything that he said, and it wasn't anything in particular that he did. It was everything that he did. Um, and uh, sort of where he came from with the Bible was he had been a student of George Lamsa. Lamsa is the man who translated the Bible back into Aramaic, which was the language we believe that Jesus, Jesus spoke at the time he was here on earth. So there are some very, very interesting differences about that. And Dr. Barrett had a huge impact on, on my life and on my early ministry. Um, but I, I bring him up because I think we all have people in our life who are such an example of the light that whether they're doing it intentionally for us or not, they are actually holding the light for us, showing us that something greater is possible. Something else is available. Um, you know, when Ernest Holmes formulated the science of mind, he studied uh, lots of the world religions. And what he felt was that there were common themes, uh, spiritual themes or common denominators, and he pulled on those threads from the different world religions, and he twisted those similarities together in what he called the golden cord of truth. So, not all religions teach the same thing, obviously. They don't all teach the same thing. But and somebody said to me, well, is this, asking about some particular, is that religion true? And I said, I think all religions are true, partly. Everybody's got a piece of the truth. But you know, the truth is so big, because the truth is infinite, I think no one container could hold all of it. I think it's interesting that so often we fear what we don't understand rather than make the effort to learn even a little bit about it. So, so I think every world religion has some variation of the golden rule. Right? The golden rule essentially says treat other people as you would like to be treated. So pretty much every world tradition does some spin on that. And they say similar things about compassion and faith and brotherhood and charitable works. Now, Jesus taught that the greatest commandment was to love God with all your heart and soul and mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. And our, our teaching in the science of mind teaches us that as we, uh, that we have a capacity to transcend the suffering that we may encounter in our life because we are a part of something that is so much bigger than us individually. And this is so important to remember that, you know, I understand when you're knee deep or nose deep in mushrooms, it seems like the whole world is mushrooms, right? But we have to remember that we are a part of something much, much bigger. You know, I think that for each of us on our spiritual path, we find more happiness in transcending our individual egos, our wants, our desires, and connecting on a deeper level, you know, um, connecting in that deep, deep place of recognizing that there is a spiritual reality within me, within all people, and in that spiritual reality, in the mystery of God, we're all connected. You know, so, so light can be used as an analogy to speak, to speak of spirit, to speak of uh, spiritual things. We certainly do that. Uh, light is not God, but God certainly is light. Mm -hmm. And for us... Uh, 
Light is assumed as a symbol of the revelation of God and God's presence, you know, not just in history, but also in our lives. When we feel God's presence, when God gives us a direction or an answer or guidance, you know, that, that's it. That's it. Um, yes, on one hand, God is transcendent, but on another hand, God is also eminent because God, God is here in every aspect, in every part of our life. We say in Science of Mind all the time, there is no spot where God is not. So I think as, as we continue to grow in our own level of faith, I believe that we become more luminous as beings ourselves. Um, I think about Moses in the Old Testament going up the mountain and having his one-on-one -on -one dialogue with God. You know, and it said that, that he, radiate, he was radiating light from this experience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in Matthew, Jesus says this. He says, you are the light of the world. And I think so often we hear that and we think, well, that's a nice thing to say. You are the light of the world. It's like, oh, happy holidays. You are the light of the world. Oh, happy holidays. You know, and it's just like we throw it off like it doesn't really mean anything. And I think it does. I think it's really, really significant because I don't think that great spiritual masters were prone to saying things that they did not mean. Right? So if he said it, he really meant it. Now, let me digress for just a second uh, uh, so fans of Jeopardy get something here today. And I want to share this with you. That December 25th was chosen for the birth of Jesus. Right? Histor that we, the, the church decided they would celebrate it on December 25th because this had been a pagan feast of the sun god uh, it, it, for the winter solstice, which marked the beginning of the ascent of light. Uh, I think it's also significant in, uh, in, uh, in the Hebrew tradition uh, the, as the light of Tob, which is at the same time ethical, practical, and aesthetic. And, and, and so this designates something that is good, and it's beautiful, and it's useful. For us as students in science of mind, you know, we, we meditate, and meditation is often described as a pure light entering the body bringing a feeling of well-being and joy. Doesn't that sound good? Yeah. A pure light entering into our body, bringing a sense, a feeling of well-being and joy. So it seems to me that our spiritual life is about finding our connection to that bigger life of which I have spoken. That we're all in a process, an unfolding of finding our connection to that something bigger. And to find something, and also I think it means to find something that is worth burning our light for, you know, the light that isn't just about us. So I want to share a story I read. Uh, there was a funeral for a two-year-old boy who died of leukemia. Understandably, he was the great light of his parents' life. They gave everything they had for the fight of his life. They moved from Washington, D.C. to Minnesota uh, to Ronald McDonald House uh, to devote full-time uh, uh, to his recovery. Uh, his mother and uh, both of her parents uh, quit their jobs for this move. Uh, you know, there are times in your life when you have to completely, you completely have to give yourself over to something or someone. And this, for them, was certainly that time. Uh, they burned the light for him, and still, and still, he died. So the family was not particularly a religious or spiritually inclined family. They wanted to do something very, very simple. However, it became apparent very, very quickly to them that to do some little thing was not going to be enough. Hundreds and hundreds of people came to the funeral for this little boy. See, I think we sometimes don't know what a light we are, even in, in a brief span of time. You know? They did not realize this about their son, that this little guy touched so many people's lives. Right? So it was, um, you know, it, was, it was a hugely painful thing. A casket's not supposed to be that small. Right? We get that. Um, so their minister came up uh, with this idea, which I thought was tremendous. Uh, the minister put a big, a big pillar candle in the middle of a huge table to represent the life 
of their little boy. They surrounded it with lots and lots and lots of little tiny uh, tea candles. And they invited people, if they were touched by this little boy, to come up and light a smaller candle from the larger one to express how their life had been touched by him. Over 300 people came up and lit these little tea candles. You know? Then they blew out the big candle in the center and then said, you know, the light that was his life on earth has gone out now. But look at the light that he has left behind. Mm -hmm. So what I want to remind us of today are, again, the words of Jesus when he says, you are the light of the world. If easy to remember that when things are going really well, isn't it? When we're doing good, when we're in the zone, when things are flowing and happening and doors are open to us, we say, wow, yeah, I must really be the light of the world. I have my groove on here. This is good. But I also want to remind you that you are the light of the world. Even if you hate your job, you know, you are still the light of the world. If your marriage is falling apart, you are the light of the world. If you are single and you wish you could be married or meet somebody, you are the light of the world. If your child is troubled right now and going through a difficult period, you are the light of the world, and so is your child, by the way, the light of the world. If you've lost your job, you are the light of the world. If you feel like you don't know what your life is about, you are still the light of the world. When you don't like yourself very much, you are the light of the world. And when you think you have failed, I promise you, you are still the light of the world because God has placed that light within you. See, that's the miracle of the light, God in you. It is still there. It is always, always there. So now, don't hide the light that God has placed within you. What an incredible waste that would be. You now get to make yourself a light into a world that looks like it could really use a little more light. Don't you agree? Let's pray. So thank you. So we join together in thought and prayer and consciousness now for just a moment, remembering that right here, the fullness, the allness of God, God's love, God's light, God's truth is present within each and every one of us. We are all emanations of the Most High God. We are all emanations of divine light. And so I know that it is ours to let the light within us shine, to raise people up, to know the truth for them, to bless them, to love them to share kindness and compassion with them, to give them some of the best that is within us is to be the light of the world. And so we include in our prayer today our family members, our parents and children, everyone that we hold near and dear, those that we hold in our heart. We say God is right where they are. And we know that within them, regardless of condition or circumstance, that they too are a light unto their world. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world in which we live. So where there is so often the appearance of darkness, we claim the truth of the light of God in and through all people, in and through all situations. We bless our church. We bless all churches, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams. We bless all paths to God. And I know that that light of the one, the one infinite loving intelligent presence expresses perfectly by means of each and every one of us today. So I claim that there is healing, that there is love, that there is all needs met for each and every one. And with a full heart, I give thanks and I release this word into God's perfect law. And so it is, together we all say, Amen. Amen.